this is this is great. Um, if everybody's comfortable, I'm I, just a few minutes after the hour. Um, is everybody comfortable if we get started? Please. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this morning. I'm I'm Douglas McLeod, the chair of architecture at Athabasca University, and um, I'm actually very delighted about this particular talk for both the reasons that it's going to be very, very interesting, but also um, because it, it's a it's done in partnership with Open Architecture, who is sponsoring today's lecture. So thank you very much to Open Architecture. But the success of the last um, three events that we've held in the virtual lecture series have suggested that we actually could do something on a global basis together. And what we're kicking around now is the idea of a global studio, which might have activities extending over the course of an entire year, which we would invite everybody who's online and everybody's institutions to be part of. We are going to apply for a grant here in Canada, which we would like to share. If there's ways that um, you want to contribute, we, we, we're not certainly not going to turn down cash or in-kind contributions, but it's not a deal breaker. Um, whatever you can bring to the table, we would be interested in hearing from you. We don't just want to do lectures. We would like to have activities where students are engaged with perhaps even creating things, perhaps even creating curriculum. We'd like to do um, activities and workshops and other kinds of things. And some of the themes that we've talked about, and I think they're all critically important, are regenerative design, universal design, and also the very serious issue of decolonizing our design education, which is something we're all looking into now and we'd like to work together on. Um, but at the same time, uh, so if that's of interest, please let one of us know, uh, Kristen or Veronica or myself or Loan or any of the people who've been involved with this, if that's something that you might want to participate in, we'd love to see it. But the other thing we want to try and do, um, over the last few weeks as we've all sort of been hunkered down in our homes and not able to do too much, I've started um, uh, actually playing music with friends who are in Toronto. Now, I'm in Kelowna. They're in Toronto. That's about 3,000 kilometers away. It's on, not always great, but what I wanted to say is if there's other architect musicians out there who might want to try a global jam, I'd be very interested in seeing if we could make this, this work as well. I guarantee you the sound quality is not going to be wonderful, but the sense of community would be. So if that's of interest to you, please let me know. Um, and just, as, uh, just to let you know, um, Veronica Madonna has uh, stepped in for, uh, for Henry Sang, who's, who's organized the other one. So thank you very much, Veronica. And she's going to moderate the questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Mappe today, please put it into the chat. And with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Lone Paulson from Open Architecture. Lone? Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, so, so I'm Lone Paulson. I'm the program director for an entity called Open Architecture. So Open Architecture is not uh, an educational institution as such. It's really an initiative of the South African Institute of Architects as part of their transformation program. And it was set up to try and find flexible part-time and blended ways for uh, people who had some um, qualification in architecture already who wanted to complete their studies and become um, full-on architects. Um, but we're unable to return to full-time studies. So we were looking to collaborate with institutions to try and set up uh, part-time programs. And from 2014 to 2019, we collaborated with the Cape uh, Peninsula University of Technology uh, on a graduate program, um, which has been very successful. And in fact, this year, CPUT um, adopted that mode of teaching into their kind of mainstream um, offering uh, because they found that this part-time blended program worked very well. And as it turns out with the COVID um, um, happening, um, it was really fortuitous in a way that they had you know, shifted over to that. So currently we're looking and discussing with various institutions um, about masters, honors and masters programs. And that's really how we got involved with this group of um, institutions who participated in this global series, because we were looking for that other institutions who were doing, doing similar things. And it was really wonderful to be able to, you know, team up with, with people who were facing the same kinds of challenges, 
had had successes, had experience that we could draw on as well. So it's been very wonderful to, to be part of this collaboration. Um, and as Douglas said earlier, also that it's now uh, morphed into this kind of global uh, lecture series, um, which is really fantastic to be able to share lectures with people from, from all over the world. Um, prior to joining Open Architecture, I was actually um, at, um, at Wits University in Johannesburg for 20 years and was the architecture <laughs> program director for a while. Um, and I first met Sachaba when he um, applied to enter first year studies. And I've sort of been watching his um, progress ever since then, both as, a, as an architect, as a researcher, and now also as a teacher and academic. Um, and it's been really wonderful to see his, his growth over the years. So when Kristen, who has an association with Bits University, suggested that we should invite Sachaba to give this lecture, uh, we jumped at the opportunity to, to not only be a co-sponsor, but also to you know, um, highlight uh, issues and challenges and research that is going on in South Africa. Um, and I believe that, um, that what Sachaba will share with us today is really um, highlighting the kind of broad spectrum of issues and challenges and academic uh, curriculum questions that are being asked all over the world at the moment um, around issues of culture, identity, and, and the meaning of space. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Kristen now to actually introduce Sachaba because she's been working with him over the last number of years uh, and is more familiar with, with the work that he's going to present. So Kristen, if you'd like to introduce Sachaba. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, uh, so Chubb and I decided to, to introduce this in a, in a bit of a different way, both to honor the topic that he's presenting and also to address the fact that we all bring ourselves into architecture. And so uh, we're starting with a bit of the story of our history. Um, but before I get to that, I'd like to observe the ancient protocol of gathering in the place where I live that the people speaking tell the connection to their place. When I'm not in Johannesburg, I stay beside a lake in the vast Shushwap watershed, lands that have been the home of the Sequepam people for over 10 millennia. I acknowledge that I'm a settler and a guest on these lands. When Europeans arrived in this region of Western Canada in the late 1700s, no treaties were ever signed in legal agreement of occupation. My family came to Turtle Island in the 1600s. Turtle Island to most of you is better recognized in today's political mapping as Mexico, the United States and Canada. So with this timeline, it, I acknowledge my own lineage that is deeply woven into the colonization of this continent. In 2007, I arrived in Johannesburg, South Africa on a Fulbright grant and with an award-winning design. I often tell people that that year introduced me to my own Western arrogance. I stayed and did my PhD at WITS. It was then that I met Sechaba and our extraordinary friendship took hold. Its depth was honored earlier this year when I became his, the godmother to he and Sandra's baby, Agape. That friendship has been filled with long conversations, generally not at work, but instead over meals or coffee, amidst great music on road trips, walking in sun-baked landscapes, and quietly whispered in the sacred caves of his home region of Kuruman. Together we have stretched our thinking around humanity and the human occupying of space. Sechaba's framing of his ongoing spatial understanding cuts across such disciplines as architecture, anthropology, archeology, span neurophenomenology, environmental psychology, and embodiment. His work explores the relationships between self-induced trauma, ritual, adaptability, and belonging. It is embedded in some of the local beliefs from his hometown as practices of place attachment. Our conversations challenge my own limitations in my understanding of architecture as defined by white ideologies. Place is a subjective experience that we all recognize as a deep part of our understanding of architecture. Expanding worldviews will stretch that understanding. Today, Sechaba will share with us a way of seeing and being in and rendering living landscapes 
that is deeply grounded in his relationship with the elders of Kuruman, his rigorous architectural training, and his own personal journey as he grapples with the ancient and contemporary role of ritual as mediator to psychological and physical attachment to place. His practice pushes back at a colonized architecture in his own native South Africa, yet has such relevance far beyond the, those boundaries of state. It is working to retrieve meaning in those sacred and precarious spaces that are in danger of being lost or hijacked or undervalued. It is with great pleasure and humility that I introduce Sechaba today so that he can have one of these great conversations with all of you. But before I hand over to him, I wanna read a short poem from the Black Lives Matter collection of the American Academy of Poets. Simply because poetry I find opened my mind, allowing it to take things in in a different way. Ode to a Head Nod by Elizabeth Acevedo. The slight angling of the forehead, neck extension, quick jut of chin, meeting the stranger's eyes, a gilded curtsy to the sun fill in another, in yourself, tithe of respect. In an early version, the copy editor deleted the word head from the title. The copy editor said it's implied. The copy editor means well. The copy editor means she is only fluent in one language of gestures. I do not explain. I feel sad for her, limited understanding of greetings. And maybe this is why my acknowledgements are so long. Didn't we learn this early to look at a white space and find the color? Thank God, oh, thank God for you are here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sechava. Okay, thank you very much, Kristen. And thank you everyone for coming to listen to this talk. I feel very honored. And after many, many years, I can finally share all of these ideas that I've kept to myself. So let me start. The title of my talk is Drawing Creepy Places, Representing Liminal Ritual Spaces in Kurman, South Africa. So I'm going to start with just a brief background of the study. Um, and then I'm going to talk um, also very briefly about representation of sacred spaces. Um, then I'm going to go into uh, three case studies, um, which is uh, three caves in my home region of Kuruman. One is called Lohobati Cave, the other one Hamohana Cave, and then Vonovec Cave. Two of these caves are currently research sites that are um, being researched by, um, uh, in fact, one Canadian university and another um, researcher who was originally from WITS, an American researcher who was originally from WITS and now is, I think, in Australia. Um, and they have, they are places that have um, lots of um, rich archaeological finds. But at the same time, they are ritual um, sacred spaces for the local people. So in terms of the background of the study, I started off the study in my, as a PhD. Um, and the main finding of um, my PhD um, was that um, in order for people to adapt to change, um, especially climate change or environmental change, rituals pl played um, a significant role. Um, they facilitated some kind of synchronicity um, between the self and the environment. So as far as diagrams were concerned, as far as representing these ideas were concerned, this diagram on the right was the only one that I actually had throughout my entire PhD as an architect. I know that's terrible and that's very disappointing. But there was a parallel study that was happening in my sketchbooks um, where I was actually trying to um, represent this particular um, diagram in a visual style that would um, much better capture what I was trying to say. So before I show you that, I want to just quickly um, discuss the theoretical framework that I used. So I 
spent a lot of time looking at anthropology, um, work by anthropologists such as Victor Turner, I'm sure everyone knows Turner, Ivan van Genep, um, and Joseph Campbell. Um, and you know, all of them have done these sort of cross-cultural studies of what rituals are. Um, they looked at various practices from around the world to, and consolidated them and sort of had a model of what uh, rituals are. Um, so that was uh, part of uh, the theoretical framework. Uh, the next element of the theoretical framework was neuroscience. And there are some neuroscientists who have begun looking at um, ritual practice. I mean, I first came across this idea of looking at new neuroscience through David Lewis Williams, who many people who um, know anything about rock art in South Africa would know about David Lewis Williams. He studied um, the way in which um, people who undergo trance um, eventually do drawings that express their experiences in trance. And he cites the brain and the, function of, the functioning of the brain as the reason why some of these drawings turned out the way they were. Although there are other hypotheses, um, that was um, his main hypothesis. So I used neuroscience as a way of also trying to understand the way um, rituals work in relation to the brain. So entoptic phenomena are one of the kind of universal things that people have cited as part of the experiences that someone has during um, trance and ritual. And then finally, I used phenomenology, so hence cultural neurophenomenology, because the problem with just using neuroscience is that people tend to then um, uh, make uh, sort of experiences, human experiences reduced to neurons and, you know, uh, just brain, electrical um, uh, brain um, mechanisms. Uh, so, Phenomenology obviously then takes into account the subjective experience of people. And so cultural neurophenomenology has um, been um, a study that tries to understand the sort of broader um, sense of what rituals are. So that was uh, the, the theoretical framework that I used. So I don't want to bore you much more about that. So in this diagram, what I was trying to show is what is this process of ritual? So according to um, the neuroscien neuroscientific explanation, rituals are an excitation of the brain. So um, people um, induce some form of trauma upon themselves. And through that inducing of trauma, they allow the self to have potential to shift or to change. So in this diagram, the first um, image at the top shows a current perspective, for instance, that somebody has. Then through ritual um, excitation or you know, some sort of dislodging happens. And this is what we call the liminal phase in ritual. Um, the neuroscientist uh, Walter Freeman suspects that through these ritual practices, the chemical oxytocin is what's mobilized. And that's what starts to allow for potential for shifting and changing and dissolving of the boundaries of the self. And then uh, through sucker, through coming back into the community, the person is brought back uh, or grounded again um, after that traumatic experience. So during this time, I was very much influenced um, and interested by Peter Rich's drawing on the left. Now, Peter is here and he's joined us and I've spoken to him several times trying to find out what this drawing is actually really about. Um, I'm yet to hear it from him, um, what this drawing is specifically about. But for me personally, when I first saw it about 10, maybe 12 years ago, I think, um, uh, I felt as if this drawing resonated with something within myself. Um, he called it a mythological um, representation of a mythological worldview of a high felt tribe. Although um, representing the worldview of other people is obviously problematic. Um, you know, we could have a whole talk about that. 
this drawing was for me something that sparked uh, a whole process of how one can begin to represent one's own worldview. And in my case, I wanted to represent um, the worldview of my own people. But I used this drawing in my as part of a way of engaging some of the ideas that I just spoke about regarding ritual. The drawing on the right is Pancho Geddes's drawing. And, you know, I think, I don't know whether Peter was influenced by this drawing or other drawings of Pancho's, but for me, the first person perspective of this drawing was what was compelling. It really made me feel as if um, it opens up a framework to begin to talk about worldview. Um, and you know, in architecture, when you are coming from the context I'm coming from, uh, no one really talks about the sort of hidden meaning behind um, uh, things that you uh, were accustomed to feeling as if have hidden meaning. You know, the world is perceived as objective. But these kind of drawings began to make me feel as if um, I could engage my own worldview somehow. So then I began to do drawings such as this one, influenced by Peter, by Pancho. Um, and in this drawing, I'm really trying to uh, discover um, certain ways of putting together uh, images to begin to describe the process that I spoke about regarding ritual. So how do you represent um, the world changing and the human being or the self being reorganized as a process of responding to this changing world. So another one of these diagrams was this one. So, I mean, these are just a sample. I did many, many of these in my sketchbook parallel to what I was doing in my PhD. They never made it into the PhD because, you know, I think at that time I didn't quite um, see the value in them as much as I do today. Uh, this is yet again another one of these diagrams where I was trying to explore. In this one, I was trying to explore the idea of intentionality or drawing your attention out into the world, um, you know, and seeking for something in the world as opposed to having a world that's already made, um, an objective world that's already made. So the, the people inside the heads are a representation of a ritual, um, being what influences perception. So I wasn't satisfied with those drawings because they weren't really capturing what this diagram was trying to achieve. So what I ended up doing is I turned the, di the diagram um, onto its side like this. And that started to open up an opportunity for me to really begin to explore um, the potential to begin to describe the relationship between the self and the world. And so in this diagram, it's um, meant to represent the changing self um, being inside a changing world. And uh, ritual being that which mediates between the changing self and the changing world. So I used that same model or that same framework to try and speak about the transition or the experience of ritual. So on the left is the first sort of worldview or paradigm of the person. And then as they go through ritual, they cross a threshold and they cross an ordeal. Um, and this ordeal uh, is usually um, a very traumatic experience. So, you know, ordeals are usually characterized by feelings of fear uh, or um, people being isolated or people going through um, sleeplessness, like I am right now because I've got a three-month-old baby. Um, you know, ingesting purgatives or ingesting um, hallucinogens. So all sorts of things are um, done to the self in order to experience this ordeal. And this ordeal, according to the neuroscience and according to the anthropologists, is what dissolves the self, what breaks the self down in order to be assimilated into a new perspective or into a new world. So that's what this uh, diagram is trying to illustrate is that the person sort of bridges into this new dimension or this new world um, through this ordeal. And so a daily practice, so you can imagine like for instance, um, the sand people um, practice the trance dance 
um, daily uh, or very often rather. Um, so someone who's going through these sort of self-induced traumas on a daily basis, you know, does that mean that their self is constantly being um, broken down so that they are assimilated with the world? That's what I ended up um, um, sort of concluding out of this exercise and ended up with a diagram like this. And in this diagram, what it's saying is that because the constant change of the world is um, requiring the self to be broken down every single day, and this trauma is what allows the self to be broken down every single day to be part of this rhythm or this synchronicity with the world. But this diagram for me wasn't complete. There were certain things that were not quite there yet. And through the sites that I'm going to talk about now, I ended up finding a way of trying to complete this diagram. So I'm going to just briefly talk about representation of sacred spaces, because these I think are the spaces where this very process of breaking down the self um, occurs. And so for instance, this is La Libella. And I think that these are the places where this process happens, where the self is restructured or reorganized or broken down, either to be assimilated into other groups um, or to be assimilated into the whole, you know, um, to inhabit existence or to inhabit life. Um, but in terms of representation, these sites are generally represented in this way. So this is from um, Mark Josenbeck, uh, Ching, Mark Josenbeck, and um, I can't remember, uh, I can't pronounce his name, but the point is that from the way I saw it, these kind of drawings really are um, objective representations of this space. You know, as far as I was, I'm concerned, they don't necessarily um, represent the meaning uh, that's embedded within this place. And that's not to say that these drawings have no value. Obviously, they've got lots of value. But, um, you know, there's to me something, a, a layer of meaning that I would, uh, would want to explore over and above them being represented as objective spaces in this way. So what has happened recently is that these very same kind of sacred spaces that uh, hold so much meaning have become, um, have, there's been an, a new layer of representation that's been introduced through uh, 3D modeling. So this is um, done by uh, a project in Cape Town, UCT, their school of architecture called the Zamani Project. And what they do is that they go using laser scanning they scan various sites across the world, uh, typically archaeological sites um, such as this one. And again, in my view, through this kind of um, methodology, I feel as if there's a layer of meaning that's stripped away, you know, because what, what, are, we, what are we seeing here um, in relation to the deeper meaning of these kind of places? Now, the very same um, project um, has done um, scans of a cave in my hometown. Um, this is the Vonovec cave. And, you know, this cave for me and for other people, not everyone in the community, because not everyone values the cave in the same way. We are obviously a diverse and dynamic group of people who come from there. But some people value this place as a sacred space. And for me, it's concerning that the representation of the space looks like this, you know, um, that we are comfortable to represent it as a planned and a section, a 3D object. Um, and so there's very little representation of its cultural value to people who come from um, my hometown. Now, a very interesting um, take on representation is, uh, comes from uh, anthropologist Tim Ingold. And in this drawing, Tim Ingold is drawing a salmon. And I know that this obviously does not look like a salmon, but what he's trying to capture here is actually the movement of salmon. 
Um, so what he's basically trying to say is that he's trying to bring back the life that's within the salmon. So this is just a quote that really brings this idea home for me um, in relation to the question of objectivity um, versus an animated life or an animated world. Um, he says, this is how we are used to drawing it. And it is the way from which Milner started out. We look at the drawing and even if poorly executed, we can immediately recognize it as a fish. And yet it might as well be dead. There is nothing in the drawing to suggest animated life. Milner's problem of how to restore painting and drawing to life was also central to the reflections of the great pioneer of modern abstract art, uh, Wassily Kandinsky. Like Milner, Kandinsky sought to release painting from the constraints of the figurative, to es escape the bondage of objects and their imagistic representations so as to reveal the inner necessity of affective animated life, of the inner movement of becoming that is so readily obscured by its outward objective forms. So I found this very compelling as an argument that, you know, to only represent something as an object, one may lose the dynamism um, of that place. And one example that I would say I've seen of this kind of representation um, in regards to sacred sites is this particular example here. Um, this is a rock painting um, which is attributed to San um, people in Southern Africa. Uh, and it is in the rain snake shelter in Lesotho. And what we see in this drawing is something that's alive and something that's dynamic. The idea here is that the people are in a spiritual space and in this space they are are busy trying to um, drag this um, sacred snake out of the space. And um, you can see that the sacred snake is coiled and it's sort of almost, in my view anyway, um, implying a sense of movement or vitality or life. And there are all these um, lines. And according to the According to the um, one um, San uh, individual who interpreted this for anthropologists, those lines are all meant to represent living creatures like fish. So this whole scene is happening underneath water. Um, so this rain animal, this snake is being pulled out of the water perhaps so that it can be killed so that they can be rain. But for me, this snake could also represent the climate or the weather or forces in nature, um, including these lines, you know. Um, so this has been a very important drawing for me to kind of capture the idea of a place that's got meaning, uh, a way of representing um, a place having meaning and um, the landscape having meaning. So another very important drawing that I looked at that influenced me is also from um, San uh, culture. And in this case, the drawing is um, on a rock face. This is obviously a tracing of the drawing, but the original one is on a rock face. And these uh, dotted lines represent a cleft on the rock. And so these mythological creatures are moving between two realms. They're moving between a, um, the physical realm of our reality, which is essentially the, the rock face and the, um, the mythological world. So you can see how some of them are sort of moving into the rock and, um, you know, some of those fish are behind that, um, that black blob. Um, but for me, again, this kind of gave a representation of something that's dynamic that embeds the meaning and the culture of people um, within it. So through that, I began to think about um, ways of representing the different ritual spaces in my hometown and in my community of Kuruman. So Kuruman is in the Northern Cape province of South Africa. It's the 
on the left, it's the dot just near the border of Botswana. And on the right is sort of a map that shows the various locations that we'll be talking about. So right at the top, at the north, is the Lokobate Cave, which is um, very just along a river. Um, these rivers are generally dried up now, but um, at, you know, at, during different seasons, there might be water there. Um, the second one is Kamohana Shelter, which is closer to where I grew up and was the shelter that I was really told about the most in my upbringing. And then right at the bottom is Vonovec Cave, which is the one that I showed you um, just earlier that has been scanned using laser scanning. So one of the most important things about this landscape, it's its relationship to mythology. And one of the main mythical characters of the is um, a mythical snake. Uh, so some of these quotes are quotes that uh, describe the way in which people perceive the snake. The first quote comes from a paper by Michael Chazen. Um, and what he said, uh, people said about the snake was that people had to show the snake respect though, but he assured us it would not hurt us since we did not believe in it. The second quote comes from some field work that I did. When I used to live there by the river, I would often meet a giant snake. It would be coiled up in my path, but I would simply go around it and go and fetch water. And when I returned from collecting the water, the snake would leave and one would see it going up the river, up the banks of the river. I was still very young and had no fear for the, of the snake. And then just this final quote, um, which I got from um, another member of my community, close member of my community. She says that the snake has often has taken me before. And this idea of being taken by the snake is a very common thing that people say in my community. Taken by, taken me before nearly when I was a child. I went out with one of the old ladies from my village. When I went out to look after the sheep, we went out to look after the sheep. I suddenly had a very deep thirst. So I decided to go towards the stream. When I got there, I heard a child crying. I saw something in the water. It looked like two arms coming out from under, the arms of a child. I went near to pull the child out. I pulled hard, but could not get the child out. Suddenly I got pulled into the water. It was the snake pretending to be a child. The old woman I was with yelled, help me, help her, please. Someone help her, the snake is taking her. The snake took me to a large cave, but it didn't take me deep. I became unconscious and suddenly I woke up by the water, by the water hole next to the village inside the clinic, where we usually collect water. I could not remember how I got there. If the snake took me, I would have been a powerful healer. This lady is actually a very powerful healer. So there's always ambiguity in the stories that she tells. I know the snake. I've seen it several times. I've seen it coiled up and large. And sometimes I would pass it and touch its hand. As a child, I would sleep with one on my left or top because one time I ask her about the story, she'll say on top. Next time she says at the bottom and on my right bottom. And I always talk to the snake. So sometimes pe when people perceive or see um, dust devils or whirlwinds, they would say that the snake is passing. And this is a very common thing that people say um, in my community. And so the snake is usually associated with all kinds of destructive forces or um, malevolent forces in, in our environment. These are drawings that um, I collected from um, the field when I was doing field work um, by, um, these are specifically by um, one character, one um, person called Buru in my hometown. And he's known for wielding snakes. He's got many snakes at his house, um, but he drew these drawings about the snake. So you can see that similar to the sand painting that I showed earlier that the snake is seen as a therianthrope, which is 
a creature that is half human, half person. But when I, even now, when I look at these drawings, they are very disturbing for me because of how often I've been told these stories about the snake from a very young age. Um, and, you know, you could think of that as priming. And so um, these are his interpretations or representations of the snake. I did these drawings um, when I was thinking about what kind of feelings I get when I think about this snake. Um, so this snake is not, for me, a friendly, um, you know, character. It's actually, uh, in spite of all the rational, rational reason and Western education that I have, I think because of being primed and conditioned by my community about the snake from a very young age, uh, I still feel very uncomfortable when I talk about it, let alone visiting as I have the sites where the snake lives. So these drawings are really um, ways of me trying to express uh, the way I feel about this snake. So the following places uh, that I'm going to talk about are actually all homes for the snake. That's where um, people in the community believe the snake lives. So the first place I'm going to talk about is Lohobate Cave, which has got the red circle around it in this image. So this is uh, Lohobate Cave. Um, well, you can't really see the cave in this image because, you know, as a visitor and somebody who's not an initiate, I would not be given access to the space um, to go any closer than this to the space. Um, but it's a space that's unknown to all the non-initiates in the community. So it's a space that's kept secret. Um, and... Um, it's a space where the snake resides. So the place is a place where teenage initiation happens at this um, particular cave. Um, and like I said, uh, it's hidden um, away from the community. So that's around by that circle, that's where the actual cave is. This is more or less a sort of general proximity of where the cave is because I haven't been initiated. So I don't know exactly where that cave is. Um, so in this community, girls are told about the snake, just like I was told about the snake from a very young age. Um, and in the case of this particular, the story in this particular place, um, what they are told from a young age is that the snake steals twins. Um, young twins, sort of children, and it drags them into the river and it kills them. You know, the snake is not by any means uh, friendly and has any mercy, it basically kills. And so young girls are told about this um, from a very young age. Um, this particular map is um, generated um, using Google SketchUp. Um, and so it's a way in which I've been trying to experiment with this idea of representation of this particular place. So in this diagram, which has deliberately been um, filtered like this, you're looking at people performing a ritual just in front of uh, the cave. So it's further in the background. And so they'll perform the ritual um, sort of in proximity to the river and the cave. So this space is far away from the actual village. So which is typically falls within the model of um, ritual practice. You know, a person is taken away from their ordinary setting um, um, and taken to a secluded place, which obviously um, is something that increases the potency of this entire experience you know, being taken sometimes late at night or early in the morning into an unfamiliar space. And so this is myself and one of the um, ladies who um, took me to the site and just standing 
in proximity to that space, um, I felt really, really scared. I mean, I was even there with two other um, friends of mine who didn't grow up, you know, knowing about the snake or being primed in the same way, but by virtue of them having heard the little that they've heard and the sort of body language of this lady, it sort of became very difficult to even um, dare to move closer um, in spite of the fact that we all are so-called rational beings and, you know, we don't really believe that there's a snake there. And so when these little girls or these young girls eventually um, go through initiation, where do they go for initiation? They go to this very space. The space that they've been told about their whole lives is um, a place where the snake resides. And so what I said earlier about the manner in which trauma is required in order to dissolve the boundaries of the self, to break down the self, in this case, the snake and it being a story that's been told to these people and being located at the river becomes immediately becomes the trauma that's required for the girls to break down the old self in order to take up a new position in society. So this is just one of the quotes from the elders who um, uh, sometimes visits the, the cave. She says, during a ceremony, the elders would walk up the path in intervals, praying to the ancestors while they pause and proceed in this manner until they reach the cave. So you can see there what is beginning to come out is that humility is one of the ways in which one can successfully cross the river without being killed by the snake. So in essence, the landscape becomes a representation of the psychological landscape. So the psychological boundary is represented spatially and that's what gives this place meaning. And so this is my attempt, the first drawing I'll show you, my attempt of trying to represent this space and its mythological qualities. Um, and so through this, I mean, obviously this is my own expression of what this boundary feels like, this mythological boundary feels like. Um, but through this, this is a way in which I'm trying to explore um, what this place um, may, the layer of meaning that one may put on top of this map in order to begin to try and bring out the myth or the story and the way in which the space is defined by that mythological boundary of fear, um, uh, how one can represent that visually. So this will be one of the first drawings that I'll show you where I'm attempting to demonstrate how one could try and represent this. So the next shelter that I'm going to talk about is Hamohana. And Hamohana is where now this particular shelter is close to where I grew up. And so if I were initiated in this community, I would have ended up being initiated at Kamohana Cave. But because I was obviously then taken out of my community to go to school and university and that sort of thing. And, you know, due to just my parents being generally more westernized, um, I didn't end up becoming initiated. But if I had been initiated, this is the place that I would have gone to because the priming that I went through was associated to this particular space. So that's the landscape and Hamohana Hill is what you're looking at in the background there. And so this is again, another Google map generated uh, 3D terrain of the place. And what we know about um, this particular landscape is that Along um, the, the line in the middle represents um, a river. Um, on the left is the actual community or village and on the right by the hill is the ritual space. And all along this river there are rock engravings and these motifs of the snake. And so if one were to apply the model that we just looked at from the previous um, space, one can then say that that river could be seen as well as um, a, a, a ritual threshold. Now, this is speculative because I've never actually seen people um, cross that river as a mythological threshold, but 
what I have seen is crossing this river just on a day to day basis with people from at home. There's been many expressions of discomfort. You know, every time people cross by where there are reeds and that sort of thing, you know, people will say, oh, you know, we're going to cross over where the snake is. And sometimes people have gone as far as saying, can you use a different route because that's where the snake is. So from that sense, then one could see that river as a mythological boundary between the village and the actual ritual space. So again, in an attempt to try and represent this, um, uh, this mythological boundary, uh, this image is um, uh, precisely trying to do that, where um, the river is kind of represented with these creatures that um, for me represent the snake. And then on the right, um, that's where the actual ritual space is. So another thing that I have been trying to do with these um, 3D surfaces is see them as the way in which uh, I described earlier the rock face as a as a threshold between the spirit world and and our world. So the 3D surface being that thin is meant to be that veil between the two different worlds. So when we come into the actual space, um, this is how the, the uh, rock shelter looks, the ritual space. I've taken students there now regrettably several times. Um, regrettably because initiates are meant to go to this place. And you know, if I take a group of 100 architecture students there, when people are meant to have terrifying fear of the place, that in itself reduces the value of the place as a ritual space. But I also think that the actual form of the space, the size of it, all lends itself to um, creating the right kind of conditions to induce as much fear in the ritual participants as possible. Because like we said, the fear is meant to break down the self so that there's a possibility for transition, for transformation, for connection um, uh, and change. And so this is again another 3D terrain. Um, and that black line is actually um, where the shelter is. Uh, there's two shelters on the site. There's one more on the north face and then there's one at the south face. And this is the main ritual space. I won't show you this too much. And again, it's been veiled primarily for um, reasons to respect the space. Again, this photograph has been fragmented in this way for the same reasons. But what we are looking at here are different um, indications of ritual use in this space, the candles. The picture on the far, far right, it's not very clear, but there are rock um, finger paintings on the surface of this space. And one can see on the picture on the left all the different um, indications of fire. Uh, so you can imagine the kind of experience people are having in this place late at night, being told about the snake, having been primed their whole lives, um, the kind of experience that they'll be having. So um, on the left side, the dot there represents a, another part of the, um, the overall structure of the space, which is um, these large dolomitic rocks that have these rock engravings on them as well. So these are also these kind of snake motifs on the rock engravings. And so again, if one were to apply the same model that I applied with the previous two, um, the person would then have to cross that area in order to, um, in order to, exp in order to encounter the snake. Um, and break through that fear or break through that priming that they've had their whole lives and hopefully not be killed by the snake. So another, another quote from um, people who have been there talking about the process of moving through the space. This happens until one reaches the end of the cave where the offering would be placed down. At the end of the cave, one would pick up a small stone and tap the rock on the wall of the cave known as the breasts and water or milk would begin to drip out. This water is thus drunk, is then drunk, and praises are given to the ancestors in hope to find good fortune. So again, 
we see here that one of the ways in which you move through this space um, is through humility. And humility is, it seems, is what allows one to be able to survive the snake. So once again, the psychological boundary is represented spatially. And this is going to be the second last drawing where, again, I'm trying to visually represent this, um, uh, this boundary, um, this psychological boundary, which is the place where the, or the threshold, which is the place where the snake resides. One th other thing I didn't mention um, in these drawings are these, um, these sort of uh, lines, which what I was trying to do there is I was trying to refer back to Tim Ingold's um, little squiggle of the, of the salmon um, and the whirlwinds as well, because you know, one of the things that I'm trying to bring back in these drawings is that vitality or that sense of movement in the landscape. I mean, right now, all we have in architecture to really represent um, vital or forces in our environment are when one looks at passive climate um, design drawings, um, you sort of do a little blue squiggle to represent wind moving through the building, you know, or a gradient between blue and yellow, blue and red to represent heat gain or heat loss. So not much work has actually been done in regards to how one represents the lived uh, or the animated environment in which our buildings are embedded. And I think to leave that to, I don't know who came up with those kind of drawings, but to just leave that up to those people is not enough. So I think that's a legitimate research project. So defining the snake, the snake is dangerous and does what it will. It is more powerful than people. The snake is responsible for all the malignant forces, destructive winds, drownings, bad luck, and sickness in our world. One's best defense against it is through respect. Besides, we can't fight it. The ritual sites are where people face the snake. Initiates with the most respect, the most diminished egos learn to cross the threshold and become capable of dealing with the snake and thus becoming adults. Now they can face the contingent forces of the world. So the last site I'm going to look at is Vonovec Cave. And this site out of all of them is known to be a very well researched um, archeological site. And due to it being an archeological site or maybe partly due to it being an archeological site, uh, the way in which local people engage this place is slightly different. It's also associated to the snake. Um, one of the archeologists who works there, Michael Chazen, told me that he was told by um, some men who came here for some ritual practices that the snake that lives in this particular cave takes you and takes you all the way to Chicago. Once it takes you to Chicago, it makes you sin, endlessly sinning in Chicago, and then brings you back so that you can die and go to hell for eternity. So obviously that's another terrifying story associated to this place. Um, and so this is just an image of the inside of the cave. Um, and there's a new walkway that's been built in the cave. I'm not going to get too much into the, a discussion about this walkway. Um, but, um, you know, the one thing that I will say is that I think the walkway should have been, there should have been more engagement with the community um, to determine what should actually be done in, in, in far as this walkway is concerned. I understand why it's there. It's there because they're trying to protect the archeology, span but in protecting the archeology, span they kind of, for me, um, forgot to consider the local cultural value of the space. And so this is another um, uh, uh, sort of site map of the area. And what I'm proposing with this specific site, because right now, like I said, it's only um, a research site. What I'm proposing is that, and I, I, I'm going to try and do this with my students um, in the next quarter, is that something be done in order to bring back the ritual value of this space 
using the same model that we've just looked at in the previous examples. This is a 3D scan, um, one of the ones that I spoke about earlier, um, of the actual cave. So this is obviously the cave outside of the context of being embedded within the hill. Um, and so the question is, what kind of ways could we as architects think about designing the experience and designing whatever one needs to do in order to bring back the, sort of the model that we've been talking about, about thresholds, which embody this moment where one faces the snake. So this is the front of the cave, um, which already has rock paintings. Um, you know, we're not 100% sure how old they are and who made them, but these rock paintings for me give the space potency. And so the rest of the cave um, has archeological excavations and there's been damage that's been done there previous to the archeological ex excavations which in my opinion has made the space lose its potency. And I would like to propose a way in which that potency of the space um, and the narrative of the snakes could be brought back into this cave. So this is how it looks on the inside. On the left, uh, you, the damage was caused by guano mining. And this is the old walkway. I didn't include the new walkway because the walkway can actually be removed. It was designed in such a way that it could be disassembled and taken out. So this is how it currently looks. One of my big problems is the way it's lit. I mean, you know, it being lit like this, how does that make reference to its cultural value? You know, how does the fear of the snake, which is such an important and integral part of the maturation of a young man or a young woman, or the process of diminishing the ego, how is that happening when there's all these floodlights inside the space. So my suggestion is to not use floodlights like that and to introduce some kind of an element, perhaps still using light because one really doesn't want to damage the space, but perhaps using light to begin to create the same kind of potentially um, uh, potent ritual experience when one is moving into the cave. The back of the cave is incredibly dark. So I would propose something that requires very little intervention towards the back of the cave, except at least for someone to be able to see where they're walking. But um, this for me is the kind of architectural intervention that undoes some of the things that have happened due to not anyone's fault um, per se, um, or maybe one could say it's ignorance, but for me, this is a way of um, looking at decolonizing uh, architecture, um, deliberately coming up with interventions that undo some of the things that undermined the cultural value of people who, you know, have long lived in this landscape. So one of the projects that we're doing now is uh, trying to bring the community back um, you know, this was in collaboration with the archaeologists. Um, so, you know, I really credit them because they are trying to um, open up um, ways of engaging the different values of this space and no, not just see it as uh, an archaeological site. But, you know, the people who are here right now are not necessarily seeing this space as a ritual space. So there could be new ways of engaging it, new meaning that's um, uh, placed upon the space, um, I would imagine that some of them are probably still very scared of being there. Um, and some of them probably wouldn't want to go to the back of the cave by themselves because of fear of the snake. And so this was an attempt for us to take back that space um, as the local community. And so these are some of the, these are the three sketches or the three drawings um, that I'm saying are my attempt of trying to find ways of representing the meaning that the local community, some of them, not all of them, I mean, let's not for one second think that everyone in this community values or perceives or even understands this mythical snake. It's a mining community. There are many people from different places, but there are still many people who do value that particular aspect of the place. And so 
these drawings for me are beginning of this discussion. And, you know, I foresee myself going through this kind of process into the future even more. And out of these drawings, going back to this, I've learned some lessons about what the issues with this particular drawing was initially. And one of the big issues here is that the human being or the person that's in the foreground here is witnessing or is in front of this contingent world. So this contingent world, one could say is the snake. The snake is contingency itself, it's change. And so in order for the human being to be in unison with this contingent world, humility is what I've learned from studying these spaces. So this diagram then would capture better um, what uh, a, a represent a mythological representation of my home. But even one last step further is that not, not everyone in this place is completely um, in tune with this type of mythological worldview. Not everyone has one particular mythological worldview. I mean, it's already a contentious thing to want to represent mythological worldview or any sort of worldview because my worldview is not going to be the same as anyone else from my hometown. But as an exercise and as, as an attempt, this is what I'm presenting for, forward. But Guruman has been colonized and it has um, had missionaries come there. And similar to every, everyone else in Guruman, I'm Christian, but I also at the same time am still terrified of the snake. And so a real representation of the mythological landscape of Guruman would include the Christian worldview um, as part of the entire schema. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mape, for that uh, fascinating lecture and for sharing your experiences and research with us. Um, if it's okay, I can go through some of the questions now. Uh, so I'll just um, work through the chat box and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to um, type them into the chat box. Well, the first question I have is how old is this community and how old is the culture? So, I mean, I'm not sure how one would really answer that um, because people, there's, there's evidence of hominids living in this area for millions of years. Um, one of the caves that has been recently, um, one of the spaces that has been recently studied um, which I've been part of, I've been co-editor, co-author in one of the papers. Um, there's been finding of Middle Stone Age artifacts. So the, these artifacts go back, I guess, about 200, 300,000 years ago. And so, I mean, it, you'd, you'd have to be very specific about that question. The missionaries arrived, I guess, in the 1800s. Um, you know, the Tswana people arrived there probably around the Iron Age. And so people have been living here for millions of years. Thank you for that response. Um, just scrolling through, uh, lots of um, wonderful uh, praises about the lecture and uh, fascinating studies. Um, there's one uh, comment here. Uh, that leads to a question <clears throat> that says beautiful presentation ritual um, in the case of initiation happens against the backdrop of natural spaces archaeological sites understandably so which often are phenomenological in experience spaces have an intangible quality of sacredness uh, etc if architects are able to create and shape and we as people uh, are trust, uh, thrust into the urban jungle cities without the necessarily having experienced fears or trauma, is there an opportunity for initiation to occur in urban spaces? 
So this is the kind of experiment I'll be doing with my students next semester. So what I'm planning on doing is for them to design a similar type of space using the sort of model at the Vonnevec cave as a way of remedying what I think is problematic with that place. But then I'm going to get them to try and do something similar in um, Bromfontein in Johannesburg, which is an urban area. And so through that kind of experiment, um, you know, we'd like to see what might happen if, uh, you know, if we were to introduce these kind of spaces in urban areas. So it's something that we're going to try and, and explore. Sounds fascinating. Um, can't wait to hear the results. Um, the next question here is, um, is it ideal to support a tradition that has uh, made people live in fear? Is it, sorry, say that again? Is it ideal to support a tradition that has made people live in fear? Well, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, uh, it is up to that community to decide what they want to do. You know, they are autonomous. And I mean, I could critique the West for all kinds of stuff that they do, isn't it? You know, um, we could critique. And, that, and I think that's actually a fundamentally different worldview because um, as far as people where I'm from are concerned, um, the stick rather than the carrot uh, is important, you know, but that's a different worldview. And so rather than us asking whether it's good or bad to support that, I think it should be about whether we respect each other's cultures. I mean, it's like basically me asking, you know, should we respect the Chinese for their culture? You know what I'm saying? So I don't know whether uh, we should promote it or not promote it. Who are we or who is that person to decide whether they're promoting it or not promoting it? You know, uh, we should all be, um, we should all respect that. And what's, what's also very important to realize is that this is probably the oldest and most prevalent practice um, across the world. So this is not just something that happens here in Africa and in my home community. Uh, if you look at African masks from all across Africa, they were used in rituals of initiation and these things look terrifying. My wife is from Zambia and in Zambia they've got something called the chinyao. And the chinyao, you know, little girls would, or little children would see men in masks um, uh, wearing these masks in the community with whips and they would chase these children around the community with these whips. And for initiation, um, you're going to be caught by one of these chinyals that you've been primed to fear your whole life. Um, but for me, out of all of this, um, people then learn how to, I think the point is, the, the, the whole point is to have an assault on the ego. The ego is the problem. And so all of these methods are to deal with the ego. So, you know, again, it's up to communities how they render that experience. Great, absolutely. Um, the next um, series of questions comes from um, Yash. He says, good day. I am a post-grad student from the University of Pretoria, and I apologize for the pronouncing. The project I am currently investigating uh, in contextually sits in the great Zimb uh, Zimbabwe heritage landscape and the project I deal with questions excavation and heritage. I ask three questions. If there is a cur um, curatorial architecture in or on and under the site, how does one meditate a program towards end users? The next question is, is and how can one explain that an interve intervention enhances deep uh, heritage site instead of detracting from its richness? Furthermore, I enjoyed your exonometric drawings, but what would happen if these are realized at one-to-one -one scale in relation to the site as something spatial instead of representational? 
Lastly, should representation necessarily be removed from the site knowing that the documentation of these sacred sites are often misrepresented in their significance, such as in Great Zimbabwe? So, okay, so let me see if I can find that question. You might have to just repeat the first one. I deal with the first one and then we just move on like that, please. Absolutely. So the first question is, <clears throat> if there was a curatorial architecture in, on, and under the site, how does one meditate a program, mitigate a program towards end users? Um, so that's the big question, really. And I think linked to what the other question was about, instead of it just being drawings, if it was actual spaces, that's actually the big question. I mean, these representations were the first opportunity or the first way in which one starts, or at least I have started thinking about this, because I know that as far as a built project is concerned, that's going to take time. And so I went through this kind of exercise to begin to think about that. But like I said, um, my plan is to engage these sites with students to see what they will produce. So I don't have the answers about how one actually goes about doing this, because how often have we you know, engaged spaces that have um, lost or the, the, in which the cultural value has been undermined and then tried to reverse that process or at least move on from that process. How often has that happened? That's not something that is done very often, I think. Uh, or at least here in South Africa, it's not something that's done very often. So, and, and particularly with these sort of ritual spaces. So it's a new thing. And I think it's something that, yeah, I mean, for me, it's basically what I see my, my career being all about. Yeah. The, uh, the next question was, <clears throat> and how can one explain that an intervention enhances, enhances deep heritage sites instead of detracting from its richness? Detracting from its richness, you know, so who was the first person to make a mark on that site? Those were my ancestors, the people who made the mark on those sites. So I'm well within my right to make a mark on that site myself. I'm well within my right as long as I think it's done rigorously and carefully to engage that site and to continue my culture. Um, and so I think that's what I'll say in, in regards to that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the next part of the question was, furthermore, I enjoyed your exonometric drawings, but what would happen if these were realized at one-to-one -one scale? Yeah. Sure, so that's what I was saying, is that that's what hopefully we can do going forward. Right. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, your drawing style is quite interesting. How do you determine it specifically? Do you admire a specific artist or gain inspiration uh, and make it your own? So like I said, a lot of my influence comes from the, you know, the, I would say, art of the um, pre-colonial sand hunter-gatherer people of Southern Africa. I've been studying the art for many years now. Um, visited many, many of the sites. There are many of them in South Africa. Um, and so I think maybe that's what's influenced my work a lot. Thank you. Um, we still have quite a few questions. Um, the next is from Darcy and it says that I'm really curious about your research and process, particularly your selection of ways of thinking and inter uh, that integrate what is as part of the fuller picture. For example, selections of phenomenological, uh, phenomenological to expand the idea of human experience beyond neural activity. When it comes, uh, so much of the world is about reducing to sim simplify scientific principles. Continuing on uh, so places are representative of all emotions, all histories, instead of curated ones that the idea architectural work can cross realms. Do you have recommendations for students that want to expand their thinking beyond reductionism and develop broader minds? Yeah, that's the whole point. I think, 
you know, like the other person said earlier, who was saying, should we promote fear and that sort of thing? I think reductionism and that sort of thing is actually a Western culture, um, you know, in my view. And so if we are looking for other ways, uh, using different worldviews and different models to explore architecture, I think, yeah, maybe that's how we can get to that. I mean, that's why I went through this process was because I wanted to see if by looking at the worldview of the people where I come from, what kind of art, what kind of spaces, what kind of things I could create, that, that was the whole point of that. So yes, you know, one thing that I've always said is that in South Africa, we need more African scholars, PhD graduates exploring these kind of things. Um, currently, as far as I know, there are three of us, um, doctoral um, African uh, South Africans in architecture. And you can imagine the more there are, the more these kind of things will be explored. Um, so that's a big project that needs to get underway is increasing the academic intellectual body of African um, architects. Thank you. Um, perhaps we'll take one or two more questions. We're about five minutes. Um, we have about five minutes left. Um, the next question is, are there other rituals and spiritual animals in uh, Kuramen uh, besides the snake that the people showed respect to? Yeah, so there are many different um, groups of people in Kuruman. You know, the snake is just one of the most, uh, how can I say, enduring myths. But, you know, in Kuruman, there are people who value the monkey or the baboon. They're called batchening. They are batlapping, which batlapping be refers to fish. Um, so there are different groups that those are specifically Tswanas, but you know, their relationship to those totems are not, it's not necessarily the same as in this case where that particular mythological entity is about, you know, inducing a particular emotional state. So they're more sort of identity, related to identity, uh, totemic identity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So maybe we'll end off on one more question. Um, thank you for your presentation. In what way does this, uh, does this could influence architectural design, hence shaping tradition architecture in the present time? Yeah, that's the big question. That's exactly the point. Uh, you know, it's just saying we've got a lot of work to do. Um, imagine, like I said, you know, 50 more people doing these kind of experiments. Uh, I mean, that, that one image that I showed about the potential of doing something in that cave, I mean, I'm imagining doing something with lights, um, you know, something that sort of animates the inside of the cave, um, something that's very light that can be removed if it's not working. Uh, you know, it could be an amazing experiment. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of work to do. Thank you so much. It was so fascinating. I think there are a few um, uh, final words that I'll pass it on to uh, before we um, end the lecture for today. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, Mr. Chaba, thank you very much for a very provocative uh, talk. And I think that the questions speak for themselves in terms of what you're actually trying to do and what you're trying to open our minds up to. I had quite a lot of closing remarks, but I think a lot of them have been covered in, in the question and answer session. Um, but just the one point that I want to make is that, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, transformation in architectural um, studies. And often it revolves around kind of diversity, equity, and, and, and access. And, um, and, and that kind of cuts it down to sort of access and demographics and that. Whereas I think that the much more important question is the one that you're posing, which is about how we decolonize the curriculum. 
Um, and, and, and that is not about, you know, just switching it to something else, but really opening up the discussion and enabling many, many different ideas and, and, and bringing many different views and voices to the table. Um, and I think that the, what's, what's really required is that we all kind of participate in this, in this discussion because, you know, we're all part of this world and um, there, are, there are many different views. And I think that we should be open to these discussions. They're hard discussions to have, but we should be open to them so that we don't end up limiting our own worldviews you know, by just what we think is, is the convention and, and, and the tradition and, and what is right. I think that what you've shown us is that there's a, there's a whole other richness by being open to this kind of discussion. And I think that this leads into, you know, Douglas has an idea about actually bringing the whole idea of decolonizing curriculums across the globe, because I think these discussions are being held everywhere. And so I think it's very pertinent. And I think your talk has been a really good kind of probe for all of us to start thinking about and, and bringing these discussions to a much, much broader audience. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, I'll just pass it to Douglas. Did you have any final? Um, thank you, thank you, Veronica. I just wanted to say thank you as well. Um, it's been wonderful to see everybody again online. I'm hoping that we can continue to do this again and again and again. And as I said, if you or your institution is interested in participating in the idea of the Global Studio, please contact one of us from Athabasca or um, at Open Architecture or at uh, CPUT um, or any of the other groups that we've talked to. I think what we're seeing is a tremendous interest and a tremendous opportunity. So um, I'm very much looking forward to our next event and our next get together, which we will post as soon as we're, we're sort of just lining things up and we will post that as soon as we know. Um, but if you also have ideas, we'd be interested in hearing them. But finally, just to thank Dr. Mathe again, um, it was a wonderful presentation and certainly I think we all learned a tremendous amount. So it, it's been another tremendous experience for us all. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess with that, we can, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll shut it down. And, uh, but please, yeah, we'll look forward to everybody joining us again very soon. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks. Thank you again, Dr. Mappe. That was just so fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sachova. Right, right, Kristen. Chat to you just now. Yeah, let's chat now. Okay. I'm going to keep Zoom running because if I log off, I think I shut the meeting down. So I'll just uh, keep it running for a couple more seconds. Okay. Thanks, Veronica, for all your help with this. And thanks, Kristen, as well. It, uh, it, it's amazing.